Good evening, everybody. Good morning to those in Australia. Um, my name is Charlie Grant, and I'm a board member of the American Australia Association. I chair the association's New England Committee. Um, I'd like to start this webinar with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of Boston, Martha's Vineyard and Sydney, and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging of the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag and the Eora people. The American Australia Association is really delighted to host this conversation between two Australian leaders in their fields, Pulitzer Prize winning author Geraldine Brooks and distinguished business leader Graham Bradley. The association was founded in 1948 and since then has provided an historical forum for collaboration and exchange between leaders from US presidents and Australian prime ministers to leaders in sport, education, culture and the arts. Today with Geraldine Brooks and Graham Bradley, we continue this dialogue. This event is part of an ongoing series of weekly webinars that supports the association's mission of strengthening cooperation and understanding between the United States and Australia. And I invite you to visit our website and our Facebook page for recordings of recent webinars and details of upcoming programs, which I hope you'll also join. The association is also dedicated to supporting the next generation of leaders, and we do this through our scholarship and our awards programs. Across our education, arts and veterans scholarships, we've invested over 12 million US dollars since 2002. And if you're interested in supporting or applying for a scholarship, I invite you to find out more on our website. So I'd like to express our thanks to Geraldine Brooks for joining us from Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts and Graham Bradley from, for joining us from Sydney, Australia. This is the second time the associations had the pleasure of hosting Geraldine, and our members and friends in the Boston area will certainly remember well when Geraldine gave that wonderful keynote address at an Australian Day dinner in Boston back in 2016. So thank you for joining us again, Geraldine. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our moderator for the event, Graham Bradley. Graham is a professional company director and his many appointments include HSBC Bank Australia, Energy Australia, United Malt, Infrastructure New South Wales, Tennis Australia and the Ensemble Theatre. Graham was formerly Managing Director of Perpetual Limited and prior to Perpetual, Graham was National Managing Partner of Blake Dawson and before this, a partner at McKinsey. Graham was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2009 in recognition of his contribution to business, medical research and the arts. Given Graham's full portfolio of engagements, one of the positive outcomes of the current worldwide shutdown is that Graham's travel commitments have almost ground to a halt, providing availability in his schedule and uh, allowing us the opportunity of having him lead today's discussion with his good friend, Geraldine Brooks. So I'm now pleased to hand the program over to Graham. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Charlie, for that warm introduction. Um, I would have made time for this event, uh, no matter what my travel schedule was, I can assure you, because it is a great uh, privilege to be asked to moderate this conversation uh, with Geraldine, someone I've known for, I think, about 25 years. Um, and on the topic of, uh, of her debut novel, uh, published in 2001, Year of Wonders, this absolutely stunning novel which I've had the uh, uh, reason to reread uh, in, in recent days. Now um, we've got uh, about, about 150 people have uh, registered for this uh, online book, uh, book uh, conversation, book club, uh, so, and they're from around uh, the United States, uh, from Canada, from Australia, um, so it's wonderful to have you all aboard and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation myself. There is a chat line uh, that you can open if you would like to send some comments or questions. And I have a number of questions that have already been sent in, so there's not more than enough uh, to talk about. But let, let me start off by saying that uh, uh, I'm sure everyone on the, the call is familiar with the novel, but um, it, it, come, it came uh, right from day one with some extraordinary accolades, um, particularly for a debut first novel from uh, Geraldine. and. Uh, a couple of the quotes that um, uh, I think are worth recalling from the great historical novelist, uh, Hilary Mantle, um, who I've enjoyed reading over the years. Year of Wonders carries absolute conviction uh, as an evocation of place and mood. It has a vivid imaginative truth and is beautifully written. Well, I couldn't have uh, said it better. 
And, and another uh, reviewer said, uh, Brooks proves a gifted storyteller as she subtly reveals how ignorance, hatred, and mistrust can be as deadly as any virus. Year of Wonders is itself a wonder. Well, I guess that resonates, doesn't it, um, in this uh, year in which we are having this, this event. I'd like to start, therefore, Geraldine, by saying this was your first novel after two published nonfiction books, uh, Nine Parts of Desire in um, 1994 and Foreign Correspondence in 1997. Um, would you like to tell us something about the circumstances that led you to turn from nonfiction to fiction and to produce this wonderful novel? Well, I'll start at the end of the circumstances. And the circumstances were uh, that after 10 years as a foreign correspondent covering wars and conflicts in the Middle East and Africa and the Balkans, I had a new baby and I realized that I needed a new gig. Uh, I didn't want to go off walking uh, through the mountains of Afghanistan or, you know, just getting up in the middle of the night and going to cover a place uh, in crisis. Um, so my mind went back to a town that I'd visited 10 years earlier when I was taking a break from my job and a rare uh, few days off. And I went for a hike in the Peak District in, um, in England. And I wanted to be as far away from the Middle East, the hot and the dry and the noisy as I could. So I was in this moist, green, wonderful um, uh, change of, of scene. And I'd gone to a town that was famous for its tarts. It's aptly named Bakewell, the town of Bakewell. And while I was eating my tart in Bakewell, I saw a finger post pointing to a, another town called Eam, and underneath the name of the town, it said Plague Village. And I thought, that's funny. Not many places try to attract visitors by putting up signs <laughs> saying Plague Village. But I was intrigued, so I hiked. I think it was, you know, maybe 10K. I'm not sure, but uh, I hiked to Eam, and in the parish church was an extraordinary little exhibit of what had happened there in 1665 when bubonic plague arrived and the villagers took this unique decision to quarantine themselves rather than flee like everybody else did and therefore spread the infection into surrounding communities. And it had been in my imagination for those 10 years and I'd been thinking about it as I covered more modern catastrophes like who are you when the worst thing you can imagine happens? Does it bring you to your best self or your worst self? And I kind of used Ian as a bit of a yardstick, like how did they come to this consensus to make this extreme act of self-sacrifice as I was covering cases of people being their best and worst self in Kurdistan and Iraq and, you know, the, the um, civil uprisings and wars that I was covering. Right, right. So it was the inherent story of uh, the plague and how it arrived in Neem and what they did in response to it that uh, you stumbled upon it, uh, really. I stumbled upon it and then, and then couldn't stop thinking about it. And then when it came time to think about what can you do that doesn't involve traveling, um, you know, uh, I think we met when I had written Foreign Correspondence, which was a nonfiction book. And I was lucky enough to get the Kibble Award. And that award is to encourage women writers. And I was extremely encouraged by it. And it also came with a nice sum of money. And I thought, I'm gonna take some of that money. I'm gonna sit down and see if I can write this story of the village of Ian and what happened during the plague year. And at first I thought it might be a nonfiction book, but when I went back there, I realized that there just wasn't enough known about what had happened that year to write a nonfiction book. So the only way to engage with the experience was to research until the line of fact frayed and then use imagination to say, well, maybe this is what happened next. Fascinating. Well, it's interesting that you, um... 
uh, you thought about it as a non-fiction book to start with because some of the reviewers noted the um, forensic journalist uh, attention to detail and so on that uh, is, is one of the qualities of the novel that makes it so powerful. But I wanted to ask you, um, in 2001, the book was published, I'm not sure what month, but uh, that was the year of 9-11, uh, with, with very different terrors uh, stalking the world at that time. And plague was not one of them. Um, and the, well, uh, some of the uh, actually, plagues since then. Actually, there was the anthrax attack. I don't know if you remember that, but after 9-11, there was the arrival of the white powder, the anthrax in several government buildings and journalists. Yes. And so there was a fear of disease in that year as well, right, right when the book came out. I was actually on tour for the book when 9-11 happened. I was in Portland, Oregon, which is about as far as you can be from New York and still be in the continental United States. But I remember it vividly. And of course, like everybody else, I was grounded. I was grounded in Portland for several days. And, uh, you know, um, it, it was it was an extraordinary time and an extraordinary time to think about how people are changed by catastrophe. And I've always been particularly moved by the guy who went to work that morning to clean the windows in the World Trade Center. And he was stuck in the elevator when uh, the planes hit. And he was the one, not the CEOs or the more authoritative or powerful or successful people who were stuck in that elevator with him. He was the one who didn't give up and he took his squeegee and he used it to cut through the drywall to make a hole that people could escape through and save wow. all their lives. And did he go to work that morning knowing that he had that in him? You know, and would he have ever known he had that in him if that catastrophe hadn't happened? So that was all in the context of which the book was published rather than the one you wrote it. Yeah. Um, but do you think all of that uh, background of 9-11 and so on uh, contributed to the success of the book, perhaps? No, I think it actually it stopped it cold in its tracks, but luckily <laughs> readers found it later. <laughs> Uh, no, it's a, it, you know, a, in, in the scheme of that time, it was a very minor thing. But, you know, you have a book out and you're in the middle of the tour and then suddenly, well, you're not having a tour anymore and you need to figure out a way to get back across the extent of the, of the country to get home. Um, and nobody knew really that that was the end of it. You know, there was a tremendous amount of anxiety that there might be more shoes to drop. So it was, you know, that what, what happened to me was because I had spent 10 years reporting in the Middle East, everybody wanted me to talk about that. And initially I said no, because I said, I've been out of the Middle East too long. I don't know anymore what the real feeling on the ground is. But then I heard so much ignorant claptrap being spoken. I realized that, okay, even though what I know is not currently on the ground, it's better than this. So I did start then speaking about my earlier life. So I went back to that and then the novel sort of miraculously found its readership anyway. Geraldine, I'd like to go back to the book. There's a number of questions that have been sent in to people that want to know a little bit about how you, what your experience was in writing the book and how you approached it. But before I do, um, there's a request to see if you can get your volume just a little bit higher for some I'll people on the line. So get, like, yeah, right. You might have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. cuddle up to the screen, uh, I'll have might to do it. Lick the keyboard, which is a scary thought. So a few <laughs> questions here. Um, your characters, um, w w some of them, I think, might have been uh, modelled on historical characters that you researched, and others are completely uh, of your own invention. Uh, what was the, uh, the story there? So as, as the journalist in me was not going to lie down, I tried to find as much as I could from the factual record. So I really scoured everything that I could find that was from the year of plague. And it turned out to be pretty short rations, um, but there were three letters from the young minister who had led the villagers during this time. 
And in one of them, he mentions uh, his maid. There's a line that says, fortunately, my maid continued in health, which was a blessing, for had she quailed, I should have been ill set. And I immediately went to see if I could find out who she was, because it's a pretty small village, and I was hoping that I might be able to deduce who she was, but there was nothing about her. So I was free to make her up, and I made her up as a young widow of a lead miner, because it was a lead mining and sheep farming town. And she became a perfect voice in my head for the novel, because she was of the ordinary life of the village, but because of her role uh, with the minister, she was in a position to observe what was happening at the leadership level. Hmm. Were there any other characters uh, that were historical? Yeah, I, I used everything I could get. So most of the incidents in the book are based on something that actually happened or is said to have happened, even though we have very little documentary evidence. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence. It's, it's more, do you believe in oral history that lasts for 50 or 100 years that these stories persisted because they were true? Or do you only believe what's written down? Because if you only believe what's written down, there's very little known about the village except the names and the occupations of the people. And from their last will and testament, you can get a sense of their material culture because in those wills of that time, they listed everything they owned. So you can very mm -hmm. clearly picture what their living situation was. Mm -hmm. And I've stuck as close to the facts as I possibly could. Well, we've got a question here from Anne from New York very much about how did you go about your research? How wide was it and how difficult was it to find material? So, as I just said, it was very difficult to find any contemporary accounts that existed from the plague year. That, that wasn't a lot. That was the wills and the, and the three letters from the minister. But there's a lot of ancillary research that you can do. Like, what was it like to be a lead miner in the Pennines at that time? And so I did a lot of research into lead mining techniques. <laughs> Uh, I did a lot of research into the Enlightenment atmosphere and how much of it would penetrate to a village like that. Uh, I had a miraculous find, which was an academic who had studied the libraries of country ministers. So I was able to pretty confidently put certain books in my minister's library and know that he would have had access to them. Um, uh, Derbyshire dialect. I wanted to give my narrator a sense of her time and place, so I, I dug pretty deeply into archaic Derbyshire dialect, and I used that rather sparingly mm. because if I'd written the whole novel in archaic Derbyshire dialect, nobody would have been able to read it. But there are some great words, and I still use some of them, and they confuse people a lot, like when it's pouring with rain. I still find myself saying it's siling down out there because to me, siling down sounds so much like heavy rain. There is some wonderful language in the book. And, and uh, I guess that was another question that we had about uh, how you found the balance of that uh, authentic uh, uh, you know, period language versus uh, mostly modern English, but uh, with the delightful uh, touches such as, you know, five and 20 rather than 25 or senite instead of, uh, you know, a week and so on. How did you, how did you balance the, 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 maybe the temptation in the journalist in you to, to give more of that rather than less? Yeah, I guess I just, I just grabbed on to the ones that really, that I loved myself. Um, um, 17th century abuse is wonderful. <laughs> A pox yes. on you, you rake shamed fanfaroon. I mean, that's great. <laughs> it's a pity we've lost some of those words. They are very onomatopoeic and uh, appealing, aren't they? Very, yes. very Anglo Saxon. <laughs> I, I know a lot of fanfaroons for sure. Yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, uh, you know, allied to that, uh, uh, some of the readers have uh, remarked on the 
you know, the remarkable details of domestic life that you were able to bring in uh, around birthing, around food preparation, religious services, obviously, but also in a lot of interest in the herbal remedies that, of course, the, the, the Gaudi uh, family, you know, which feature very broadly in the, in the, in the novel, including uh, Anna's own resort to uh, opioids, uh, for example. Um, uh, how, did you, how did you go about that research? That, that was really knocking on an open door because there's so much uh, interest in that, um, for better and for worse. You know, I, I'm very much a believer in science, um, but there is a tremendous romanticization of, oh, it was all better when we were m much more close to nature. Well, yes and no, but if you go to any graveyard and you see how the maternal and infant mortality is on display there, you realize that herbal knowledge goes only so far. That being said, it was better than the, the, than the medicine that was practiced in the day, which would completely head up the backside. I mean, that they were bleeding people, that that was all they could offer, the so-called barber surgeons. Uh, I did have a young mm. friend who was a medical student who uh, had access to a wonderful medical library at Johns Hopkins who helped me out with some of the dreadful details of obstetrical practices in the in the mid 17th century and I do have this dark side I can't help it I consider it my secret inner Stephen King so when I find out something really ghastly I have to use it well uh, that's that's an interesting uh, segue into my next question to you Geraldine there, there are some highly graphic, um, harrowing scenes in, in your novel. Uh, I'd, I'd call them gruesome. Uh, the drowning of the, of the witch, uh, for example, uh, the, some of the childbirth issues, uh, obviously the death of, of children, the impaling of, uh, of Anna's father uh, as a punishment for theft. I mean, these are hugely, uh, you know, the gruelling experiences. Again, um, did they come from your research or did you uh, do they come from life experience? I guess is one of the questions I'm asked here. Uh, I see that I'm disappearing into the Stygian gloom here. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna turn around and turn the light on. <laughs> Get more light. Yes. <laughs> it's the sun gone, gone down, has it? <laughs> That's slightly better. Yes. 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 The, sun is, the sun is setting here. Um, so. I was unfortunate enough to have an obstetrical emergency with the birth of my oldest son. And I can tell you that while the implements used were sterile and, and high tech in a tertiary hospital, the fear of losing a child is exactly the same, I think, experienced by me as it was by a woman in the mid 17th century. So. Part of it came from experience, but much of it came from research. The, the being, the being um, impaled to the stoves of a mine, uh, if you stole from a miner, that was entirely true. That was the punishment. Um, the witch drowning, um, also based on records, does, and, and, and the accused woman's reaction is also taken directly from the transcript of a Scottish witch trial where mm. she knows that she is going to be executed. So she's going to go down fighting. So she gives every man in that room something to think about by saying what a great lover Satan was and how all their wives thought he was better than they were. And that is the truth. You know, that's from the record, the court record. So. I love what Mark Twain said, um, fiction must be plausible, truth needn't be. And ah. If you can find these truths that are, are so remarkable, you're well advised to steal them for your work, I think. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. F follow on question then, um, the epilogue, uh, where Anna uh, comes to, to find uh, her new life uh, in Andalusia. Uh, you know, as the, uh, at least in name, wife of a Muslim, uh, you know, doctor there. 
that perhaps drew on your Middle Eastern experience, but uh, did uh, you know was there a bit of bravery in in, in creating that that uh, uh, end to the novel? Possibly folly. Uh, I've got a lot of stick for that ending. People write to me even today, very cross with me for that ending. But I, I possibly should have said in the afterward, it is based on a true story. And I'll give you my thinking on that. So a wonderful writing teacher once said, as a novelist, your job is to take your protagonist and keep pushing their head under the water all the way through the book. But in the end, you have to decide, are you gonna sink them or let them swim? And I'm really in favor of letting them swim. I think if you've taken, you know, 350 page journey with a character, I really, really want the novelist to give me a way out for that person. So I was thinking, what is the way out for Anna? She's had so much loss. And the truth about Ian is it didn't recover for over a hundred years. It was a, a tremendously damaged, traumatic place for a long time. A uh, very sad story, really. So I wanted to get her out of there. And the same way that when I was in the Middle East, in the hot and the bright, and I wanted gray and green and damp, I wanted the same for her. I wanted to take her out of gray and green and silent and put her somewhere really bright and noisy. And that's where I maybe took a little bit of a leap because I'd read Camus' The Plague and it's set in Oran. And I thought, why don't I take her to Oran? And I thought, is this even possible? So I started reading about journeys of lone women in the mid 1700s and I came across the most extraordinary story of two Irish midwives who set sail for the colonies in America and their ship was hijacked by Barbary pirates and they ended up in Algeria well not Algeria then but um, they ended up on the Barbary coast and they're about to be sold as chattel slaves and then one of them demonstrated her skill in midwifery. And the two of them then got set up as medical practitioners to the community and became respected and valued women in that community. And I thought, that's it. That is what is going to happen to Anna. Wonderful. But Wonderful. I decided I, thought... I left out the pirates, thank God. <laughs> yeah. So fiction needs to be based in truth, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Very, very powerful. Um, which brings me to uh, a number of uh, uh, the uh, uh, participants here are, are very interested in your writing technique, if you're prepared to share some of that with us. You know, do you sit down and write whole chapters? Do you, you know, sketch the whole book out? Do you rewrite and rewrite? What's your approach? So, yeah, the process question, it's something that's changed over time with this book. I think this book lulled me into a false sense of security because unbeknownst to me, I'd been kind of writing it in my head for 10 years before I actually sat down to write it. And therefore, you know, because I'd thought about it so much, it flowed pretty well. And I thought, well, you know, where's all this tortured writer stuff come from? This wasn't tortured, <laughs> really. This was really fun and compared so, to- So you had, you, 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 you walked, hiked into Eam 10 years before you sat down to write the novel. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, oh. yeah. And, and so I had this ridiculous luxury of having chewed on the material for so long, even before I did the research and, and all that. But I could hear her voice, Anna's voice very clearly to me and um, yeah, and then, you know, the, the rude awakening is that it, it doesn't happen that way if you haven't been thinking about something for 10 years. And, you know, it, 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 uh, at other times, it's, it's a very strenuous process. But what I have discovered is, you know, rewriting is absolutely crucial. And most of us, I think, rewrite the beginning of our books many, many times, which is why the beginnings are so much better than the endings in most novels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So that's well, you have to capture your you have to capture your reader in the first uh, sentence or paragraph, well, don't you? Well, you do, but but it's all, always so much more tempting when you get up in the morning to sit down and rewrite than it is to surge forward into the bit that was the hardest, which is what you always leave till last, or at least I always leave till last, the gnarliest part of the book. And then you've got the publisher breathing down your neck or, you know, you've got your own pressures and you need to get it done. And so I'm trying to resist that and give as much attention to rewriting the second half of the book as I do the first half of the book. But it's always been a very instinctive thing to me. I've mainly written in first person because I like the directness of that and I like the way it connects the reader to the story. And so until I can hear that voice in my head of the narrator, I really can't start. But once I can hear her voice, then I know who she is and who she is tells me how she's gonna act. And that sets the plot in motion. Mm -hmm. Well, your, your, your subsequent novel, which came a little faster than 10 years, uh, March, uh, of course, the Pulitzer Prize winning book of fiction was a male voice. Um, yes. Was that a very different experience? Yes, that was pretty terrible experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I started writing People of the Book and it was a very complicated story with multiple narrators and time periods and it was, it was overwhelming me. And then I got the idea for March and I thought, this is one year one man's life, I can see how to do this from start to finish, I'm gonna do that. So I, I set aside people of the book and I wrote March. And the only thing I can say in favor of writing with a male narrator is that men have a lot more on the historical record. So I had this wonderful trove of material to delve into, you know, the scant rations of Eam and even the absolute lost to history nature of the maid of the, of the rector couldn't have been more different when I decided to base my character on Bronson Alcott, the father of Louisa May Alcott. And he was a very radical man, uh, a reformer of all kinds, anti-slavery, um, uh, animal rights activist, progressive educator, a real radical guy. And he wrote every day of his life, extensive journals. He had an extensive correspondence with all of the great thinkers of his time. People wrote about him. And I realized if you're writing about a man anytime other than our own, you're gonna have a wealth of material to draw on, which is a great luxury. But being mm. inside a guy's head, is very different and um, you know, he could be such an aggravating guy. So I kind I miss Anna, I never miss Mr. March. Having such a trove of material though, does that inhibit your imagination? I mean, you had a very free reign in, in, uh, in Year of Wonders, didn't you? It would have inhibited my imagination if I was trying to write about Bronson Alcott, but I wasn't, I was trying to write about somebody who didn't really exist which was the absent father and little women. So I had this wonderful free reign imaginatively about what his civil war was like. All I was doing was drawing my character and the way he thought and the way he spoke. But I could move him around like a chess piece through the battlefields of the civil war. And, and so there was plenty of room for imagination. One of my um, few, few book projects that I've had to abandon was, I, I was incredibly intrigued with Jane Franklin, who I think is a most underrated historical figure, really extraordinary woman, um, known as the wife of the governor of Tasmania and John Franklin, the, the Arctic explorer, but such an interesting person probably the most well-traveled human being of her generation. And she went mm. everywhere. Uh, she walked across the Southwest wilderness and all the belittling male accounts of her say she was carried in a chair. Well, if you've been in the horizontal scrub. In scrub. South you know, they couldn't be right. <laughs> that is so untrue. So it was extraordinary that she decided to do it and that she did it. But, you know, um, 
her relationship with Strezlecki, there's so much interesting, her, her, her extraordinary betrayal of Mathena, the Aboriginal child that she adopted and then abandoned. So those, it was, it, it's always intrigued me because I love Tasmania so much. And I started to write about that and she kept a journal every day of her life and wrote down every single thing. <laughs> And there just wasn't any room for me. You know, it's a job for a really good narrative historian to do her justice one day. Mm, mm, mm. But let's uh, come back to Year of Wonder. Um, uh, a, a couple of questions that come up. Uh, uh, the, the, the book is, is of course, in the, uh, set in a time when people didn't understand plague. They didn't know what its uh, biological uh, source was. So that was part of what led to the huge superstition, which presumably had been going on for hundreds of years, ever since the Black Plague hit Europe, uh, and, and probably, uh, you know, as we know, killed perhaps a quarter or a third of the population over the course of a couple of centuries. The question, though, is um, we now know a lot more. Oh, I guess there's two questions. One is, did, did England learn anything from the story of Eam? Do you know if it made any difference to how people re re reacted or or was this a case where this was kind of the tail end of the plague in Europe and it didn't really uh, uh, return uh, virulently? I don't think the story of him was widely known outside of Derbyshire, to be honest. It was a very small community, fairly remote in those days. I think the local communities knew the story, but I don't think it got any traction for another hundred years. And then people went back and started looking into it. and. Interestingly, people are still looking into it because it turned out that the mutation that defended the survivors of plague in Eam is also the same mutation that is defensive against uh, HIV turning into full-blown AIDS. And so the people of Eam who are descendants of the survivors uh, were instrumental in research for, um, oh. for yeah, HIV. Um, therapy but at the time not so much so I don't know that there are broad lessons I think that the narrow lesson is that there was extraordinary leadership in that village it was the young minister and his predecessor and at that point you're in the thick of the wars of religion and different approaches to how you should worship and these two men had very, very different approaches. One was what we know as a Puritan, and he had lost his pulpit because with the restoration, that was very much out of favor. So the, the young minister was much more of a, what we would now recognize as an Anglican or an Episcopalian high church kind of guy. But they came together to lead the community hmm. through this thing. And I think, you know, I think what we're feeling here very acutely in this pandemic is a lack of leadership. And that's why this country is doing so badly with it. Mm. Well, it's a devastating story, isn't it? Uh, historically, that in, in EAM, uh, at least the numbers I've read, you know, 260 of 380 people died during the course of the, the self quarantine, self voluntary self quarantine. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, again, you know, we have to take every every so-called fact with a grain of salt because we don't have hard information but it does seem like the death rate was extraordinarily high just from the plague burial grounds that exist there and yes if you think about it you're in a small community and two-thirds of your neighbors are dead in a year it, it's mm -hmm. horrifying and you think about what the practical implications of that are you know, people who knew how to do a certain thing that was crucial to the village, they're gone. So somebody else who doesn't know how to do it so well has to do it. And, you know, it, it, it must have been just a, a devastating year. Mm. So uh, the, uh, there's so many obvious um, analogies out there to the plague that's uh, besetting the world at the moment. You've mentioned the issue of, of extraordinary leadership, but uh, one of the themes, one of the amazing th things around him is that it didn't break down civilly. The, you know, it, people did stick with the, the rules for an extra, you know, in extraordinary circumstances, more or less. And uh, 
Uh, and so well, do you, you see know. other parallels with what's going on in the world today? There, there, there were some pretty dark things. I mean, the, the story of the, the grave digger who, you know, prematurely saw his clients off and also stole from them, that is from the historical record. Wow. So it was not a village of saints by any means, but on the other hand, and also I've, I, I indicated this as much as I could, there was, there was pressure on them to stay because if they fled, they would have been ostracized. Yeah. Um, and we see that, I mean, I live on Martha's Vineyard and there was tremendous resistance to people coming here to their second homes at the beginning of the pandemic, which I found quite unreasonable because it's so much easier to socially distance in a spacious summer home than it is in an apartment in New York with one elevator. So I thought that that was a fairly heartless point of view that some of my neighbors adhered to very strongly. But, mm. you know, many, many people did come in March and quarantined themselves and lived quietly and the case numbers were very small here, thank God. Um, but there was real fear and you see what fear does. What fear does is always makes us, us and them, you know. And I think we have to resist that. We always should resist it because it doesn't bring us anything good as a species. Every time we fall for this other rising, we end up losing. And, and of course, uh, you know, back in the, uh, the 17th century, people didn't understand disease transmission and the things that we do understand today that, you know, would, would reduce in most people's mind the, the risk associated with people coming in well they didn't under they didn't have a germ theory of disease but they they were it was it was amazing what they did know they knew that you needed to be apart from somebody who was infected they had no they had all kinds of crazy ideas about how it was transmitted but they knew that distance was protective they knew that time was protective that's why we have quarantine that was the 40 days that the boats had to stay offshore before they could dock during the Black Death. Um, so they, they had some practical knowledge. They didn't have an understanding of, you know, they made mistakes when they killed all the cats and dogs. They actually made the plague worse because it was mm. the fleas that were transmitting it and they were doing it via the rats. And once the dogs and cats were killed, the rat population exploded, which meant the flea population exploded. So they made some mistakes there. Hmm. Was there any historical uh, background to the burning of, of, of clothes and yes. furniture? Yes, they did. They did figure out that if you got rid of the things that an infected person had touched, and that was, again, it was killing the fleas, but they didn't know what they were doing. They just knew that if you did that, that helped. Hmm. Hmm. So no doubt uh, in, in this plague year, uh, your book's getting something of a resurgence of interest, is it? It is, yes, it leaves an ill wind and all that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a number of people have asked, you know, is there a movie in your book? Yeah, well, interestingly, it just, it's been optioned three or four times. Um, there was a wonderful Australian crew that were trying to get it made early on, but it didn't happen. and. Then it went to Andrew Lincoln, um, and now it's just been picked up by Olivia Coleman's production company. So there's a new option, and this time it's for a limited series. So, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, but I'm glad <laughs> that somebody's interested in making it, and they actually have written a script, which is quite wonderful. So who knows? And, and would you be involved in, in, in the, the script or the screenplay? Well, you know, because I never believe these things are going to happen, when I get the contract, I always write silly things into the contract. And one of the silly things in this contract is that I get to play a poxy corpse on a death cart. <laughs> uh. Well, um, it, it makes me, uh, it leads me to a fairly unfair question for a successful novel, but given the experience of the last 20 years and particularly what's happening in the world today, is there anything you'd change in the, in the novel if you were writing it today, do you think? 
Well, I definitely explain in the afterward why I ended it the way I did. Uh, I think when I read it now, I see technical things as a novelist that I would do different differently. It's it's a very plot heavy novel. I think I might be more confident to trust the reader to stay with me with not quite so much one thing after another, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, I still miss Anna and I think about her a lot and mm -hmm. you know, I know how her life went on after that. So, you know, that's uh, just just in case anyone's interested, she has a very full life that she dies in an earthquake. <laughs> so another unfair question to any author I know is coming from, from Lois here, uh, one of our audiences saying, <clears throat> are you working on a book right now? I am so working on a book right now. It's taken me a very long time. Um, and it is almost finished, I'm happy to report. I can smell the barn, which is an appropriate expression because the book is called Horse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to give us any more clues? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a, a bit like people of the book structurally in that it occurs in three distinct time periods. It, the, the spine of the novel is the historical story of a racehorse of the 1850s. But there is a missing painting of this horse, which takes us to the abstract expressionist movement in New York in the 1940s. Mm. And then there's a contemporary thread with an Australian osteo preparator who works at the Smithsonian Institution. In oh, wow, it sounds intriguing. A very different uh, historical period for you. Um, <laughs> it sounds a little too early for Farlat, so uh, it's, uh, it it's, came a bit late, I think. It's a, it's a horse that was the most famous racehorse of its generation, but has become more obscure, so that's good for me. So I'm yeah. un un unearthing the fascinating story of this horse. And, uh, and do, you, do, you, um, uh, do you relish being under a, a, a time deadline? When, you, when you're trying to finish a book? I mean, you came from the journalist uh, uh, life where it was always deadlines. I, I like a deadline. Uh, life gets more complicated as you get older. So sometimes banners fall into the works and I've become more relaxed about realizing that if you have to take more time, it's not the vaccine for COVID that I'm working on here. People can wait for this. <laughs> Yeah, got a uh, got a question here. Um, well, really, a comment from Deborah uh, saying how much she enjoyed your reading of Year of Wonders on presumably on an audio book. Um, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of that. I must find it. But have you read other books uh, that you've written on audio? I have. I read um, I read Foreign Correspondence. Um, I I like reading them. The publishers don't always trust me to do it. I, uh, obviously, if there's a male narrative voice, uh, I can't do it. But uh, I, I can hear it in my head in a way that it makes it very hard for me to hear somebody else read it. So I like, I like to read it. So I'm glad that that uh, participant enjoyed it. I, I very much like hearing authors um... Bill Bryson comes to mind reading reading his books. Um, he, he does it extremely well. So I look forward to hearing you, Geraldine. Um, here's another question. Do you have, uh, are you trying in your books, your novels, to leave behind uh, a moral message to your readers? Do you set out to do that? No, I don't. I set out to tell a story. But... Um, I have, I have realized over time that despite my best intentions, there often is one. And far be it from me to tell anyone what they should get out of a book because I know with my own relationship with books, it's a different relationship at different times in your life. And I think about 
books that I've read. And when I read them as a young person, I got one thing. And then when I read them now, I get something entirely different. So I think that that's the magic is the novelist puts it out there and, and the circuit is completed by the reader who finds what they need to hear. But there is a, an ongoing drumbeat in all the stories that have ever interested me, which is about the importance of the person who isn't regarded by society. And I think that this is, this is the essential Australianness of all my books. Even if they're not set in Australia, there's a very Australian heart there beating away, which is for the underdog and for the person who isn't powerful and isn't necessarily considered by the society as important, but they turn out to be the ones who are the most important in the end. And then the other thing is, you know, it's become very banal, but it's also very true what unites us is always going to be greater than what divides us. And the ones who can stand up against otherizing, um, thank God there's always a few of them when this terrible, um, terrible need to create us and them emerges in our societies. There are always the people who defend our unity. Hmm. Thank you. The, um, uh, there's a, a, a comment here from Christine. Um, you said how much you enjoy your, you miss Anna. Uh, her suggestion is now that maybe horse has finished, there might be a post plague book uh, on Anna's later life. How's that for a thought? Yeah, that is a thought. That is a thought. Um, I, I could, I could entertain that. I, I actually feeling now that my kids are older because I, I turned to fiction uh, because I had a young child and it's been a wonderful life to be around for them and have the ability to be at home uh, even while working. And now they've grown up and fledged and they don't need so much maternal wing. What's tempting me is returning to journalism actually. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Uh, be, is that a, a function of uh, uh, your view on the quality of contemporary journalism and the need to improve it? No, I think there's wonderful work being done. I mean, more wonderful work than I can read in a day. But there are certain stories that are very close to me that are perhaps not covered. Um, you know, I, the places that I cared about and... Uh, uh, I still care about and I feel are very misunderstood or, or neglected like Yemen and Iran. So uh, I don't know if anybody would be interested in me doing that, but it's certainly something that I think about doing in the future is returning um, all these years later and seeing what's changed and what hasn't. Thank you, Geraldine. Well, um, you and I met uh, uh, when uh, uh, when we met at the Kibble Awards, uh, which you won for Foreign Correspondence. And I've got a question I'd, I've been dying to ask you, and that is, have you kept up with the pe the, the pen pals that you uh, wrote about uh, in Foreign Correspondence all those years ago? So I kept up with some of them, and uh, the, but. The, the the sad irony is the family that I'm closest to is the pen pal I never was able to meet because she had died of anorexia just before it would have been possible for us to reconnect. And she used to spend her summers on Martha's Vineyard. And it's very largely because uh, of the fact that I found her name in the Star Trek Mr. Spock fan club newsletter when I was 11. And we started writing to each other and we essentially grew up together, uh, divided by oceans and, uh, um, but she would write to me from Martha's Vineyard in the summers. And when I came here for graduate school on the Greg Shackleton news correspondence scholarship, I thought I was just going to be here for that, that part degree and then I was going to go home and get on with my real life but there was one place I really wanted to see which was this Martha's Vineyard and I mentioned that to a classmate and he said I go there every summer uh, you should come with me and reader I married him that was Tony Horwitz and oh really 
Was... We fell in love with Martha's Vineyard and each other, and uh, and we ended up we've been here now since um, 2006. Well, you only had a few years together there, unfortunately. Yeah, they were great mm. years. So, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. We're getting close to the end of the time, Geraldine. Um, uh, I, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about uh, Year of Wonders and how you feel about it now, 20 years on, almost? Uh, just incredible gratitude uh, for the readers that found it and read it and handed it to their friends and took this book that um, it seemed that uh, the times were not on our side when it was published and yet it managed to find its audience and continues to be read. So I don't think it's been out of print, has it, since it was first published? No, it hasn't. And, uh, you know, so I'm, you know, I think all authors should be just so grateful to their readers and for people's interest and uh, support your local bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> your independent bookstore, so because uh, they're so important in in the success of a book like this that might otherwise never be found. Thank you, Geraldine. Well, um, one of the things that uh, characterises the life of a writer is that you spend your time working from home, which is something that all of us now are having to come to grips with and uh, with certain uh, apprehension. But I think many of us are finding that it's uh, it's actually not a bad lifestyle as long as you're not too distracted. Um, and I'm just interested in what you do to make sure you're not too distracted. Well, when you're fighting at home. distraction is one of the greatest tasks of a novelist at any time. And uh, but for me, it's been it's been a real blessing to have my sons back home in a way that I didn't expect. And uh, and my older one is a molecular biologist, and you know he finds that he works more effectively here than he did in the office. So. <laughs> I think that there are going to be big changes as a result of this. Hmm. Well, we are coming to the end of our hour and um, uh, I want to close with, with a personal note is I've always wanted to be, have the time, I guess, to belong to a book club, but I've never felt that I'd do justice to the books because of my business commitments and busy life. But um, uh, I never thought that my first book club would be an international one with uh, people around the world. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I've enjoyed it. So um, I think uh, I'm going to try and join a book club and particularly an international one. But this has been a very rich conversation and absolutely delightful for me, Geraldine, to reconnect with you and to hear the background story and your thoughts on Year of Wonders, uh, a book which I have now enjoyed reading twice and I'm sure I'll read again. Uh, one day with different eyes as well. Uh, so on behalf of everyone who's here on, on the line from all around the United States, Canada, Australia, and possibly elsewhere, thank you very much for sharing so ful fulsomely um, your, uh, your, your thoughts and views and your comments on, to, on our questions. So I've got a whole heap of thank yous uh, spinning up on the web chat uh, here, uh, site here wonderful uh, time with you thank you so much uh, and all the best with horse uh, and with the sequel to world of, uh, year of wonders well thank, thank you, you so much graham it's been wonderful reconnecting with you and thank you for these terrific questions and thank everybody who sent questions it's been a joy excellent Love thank you bye-bye